I'm very excited about our topic this morning. You see, today I have the unspeakable privilege of announcing that our God is an all loving God, that He loves us more than we could ever dare possibly ask or imagine. And I have been praying all week that somehow and in some way, our God will speak to each and every one of us about the power and the depth and the breadth and the height of his love for you and for me. We're in the middle of a series titled The Seven Great Wonders of the Spiritual World. And I want to begin by asking you a question. What does, as we've been following through in who God is, what does this all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, exceedingly righteous God think about you and about me? How does he view us? What is our standing before him? And I want to do that by asking you to recall, those of you that are old enough to remember, the scene in The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy and the lion and the scarecrow and the tin man finally reach the Emerald City. And once they go through the city, they enter the house of Oz and they tiptoe down this great green hallway and carefully, slowly open the door and enter this great domed throne room. Once the door is shut, all of a sudden, there are these sights and these sounds and a booming voice and, and smoke coming from the center of the room and filling the room. And then I remember the words, I am Oz, the great and the powerful. And then he said to them, and who are you? Who are you? And they tremble. And they stumble. And they appear before him. And they wonder, what does this great Oz think about me? What is our standing before you this very moment? How do you view us? And I've noticed over time in ministry that many people feel this way about our omniscient, all-powerful, ever-present, exceedingly righteous God. What about me? How does he view me? What kind of standing do I have before him? And that's the question I want us to answer this morning by acknowledging that the Bible is quick to reply to that kind of question. It's quick to respond. It says, our God, that we've been tracing the attributes of God and the character and the nature of God and who God is, that our God is an exceedingly, unceasingly, unfailingly, everlasting love for you and for me. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, I, and, I, and I love these words. It's John, 1 John, chapter 3, verse 1, in the English Standard Version. John writes, What kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God? What kind of love is this that our Father has given to us to be called children of him. I remember when our kids were growing up for probably 15 or 20 years, we took a family vacation to Kiowa Island, stayed in the same little villa every year, had everything packed up in the van. We'd wait all year to get down there. It was a wonderful place and we'd rent the bicycles. And um, there's a strong wind along the beach and it's a very unusual beach because it, when the tide is out, it's very flat, and very hard. It's excellent for bike rides. But the bike rides 
you have to catch the wind because it's so strong. And so we would ride inland, inland down to a certain beach access about three miles away. And then we'd catch the wind and ride back up the beach. And I remember one evening where my two boys on their bikes took their hands off of the, the wheels and the handlebars, they stretched their arms out with the wind at their backs and stood up and they caught that wind and they must have gone for a mile, just being pushed gently along by the wind at their back. As, as I was watching that on this beautiful beach with my two boys, my heart was bursting with fatherly love to them. See what manner of love this is that the Father has given to us. I have the seating and the unspeakable privilege today to tell you that if you take that kind of fatherly love that I had and multiply it exponentially, we would get, begin to get just a glimpse of the idea of the depth of the love, the unfailing, unceasing love of God for you and for me. What kind of love is this, John says? What kind of love is this? What kind of love is this from the Father that he has given to us? What kind of love is it that we matter to him? That this all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, exceedingly righteous God wants us to be received into his very family circle as his children. What manner of love is this, John asks. Now, the question becomes, how do we know God loves us? How do we know that? Well. First of all, he comes right out and says it. I love you. I love you. I love you. Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's a kased love, a steadfast love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. It's no small thing to tell someone you love them. And that's what God is doing here. He is telling us, I love you. I love you. I love you. That's a big deal. It's no small thing. Those of us who are married re recall what it's like when we begin a dating relationship with someone that we're sort of interested in and want to get to know them a little better. I remember that you have to make that first phone call. Would you like to hook up or get together maybe for some coffee or a little walk? It's a big deal making that first phone call. It's vulnerable. You wonder what a person is going to say. How are they going to respond? I mean, it's more than calling up mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. You don't know where this person is. Love is a serious thing. It's solemn. It's a solemn word. It's a big deal when you're about to tell someone you love them. And so over time, you go through that dating relationship, and then you find that you have these compatibilities. You really enjoy being together. And at some point, you know, this man knows that he has to tell this woman, I get that L word out. I, I, I love you. I love you. I love you. Well, God tells us that I love you. It's serious. It's solemn. It's important. This uh, winter, I went through a five-week series on the life of David. And, and one of those stories is the story of David and Jonathan and their love for each other in which God describes the essence of biblical love in five verbs, five Hebrew verbs verbs that he describes this relationship between David and Jonathan as the model for all relationships. And it begins with akav, the hachav, the deep abiding affection and love for someone else. It's the kind of love that says, I'm not worried about what I get. This is all about me 
giving. It's a sacrificial kind of love. Well, once there is an akab, David and Jonathan form a berith, a covenant. There is a promise involved in love that you can trust, which is the third step, the kased, the steadfast love, the everlasting love of God. You, you go from an affection to a promise to kased, to steadfastness. To You can trust this love on the basis of my affections and my promises. You can trust in my love. Now the question becomes that that love fails. We're human beings and we fail, in which God provides the fourth verb for us. When we fail, he says, I am going to give you the, the cane, the grace. I, I'm going to give you a grace that, that when you're faithless, I will be faithful. And when you have the affection and you have the promise and you have the trust and you have the grace, it leads to the shalom, the peace of God, a sense of inward tranquility, a sense that everything is right in my life and my world. That's the model of biblical love. God comes right out and says, I love you that way, with a deep abiding affection, with a promise made that you can trust in, with provisions for failure on your part that I will provide an unfailing love. And that will lead to a peace inside and an intimacy and a fullness about relationships. God says over and over and over again, how do we know he loves us? He comes right out and says it. I love you. I love you. Hear that from God this morning. Hear God saying that to you. Hey, I love you. I love you. I love you. Well, not only does God tell us he loves us, but talk is cheap. What about this love? How deep is it? He said, well, not only do I tell you, but watch what I do. I will show you that I love you. And God sends his son Jesus as the perfect example of that. Look at the life of Jesus. One thing people could never say about Jesus is that he didn't love people the lame, the hurting, the oppressed, the helpless, those on the outside looking in, the rulers, the soldiers that crucified him, a thief on the cross that we talked about. God loves his people through his son, Jesus Christ. He loves them. There's sort of a universal agreement about that. People might not like the church, but nobody says bad things about Jesus. I remember years ago, we were doing a study of why people weren't coming to church. And we so we sent our members out and we said to them, ask your friends that don't come to church. Don't ask them why they don't come to church because they won't tell you. Ask them why their friends don't come to church. And boy, did we get an ear full when, when, when our members came back to report to us. And they said, they don't want to sing anything, say anything, sign anything, do anything or give anything. They, they, they said things like, when I come to church, all it does is make me feel guilty. They said, they said I, I know the deal. I know the script. I know the playbook. It, it makes no practical difference in my life. But one word was conspicuously absent from their responses of why they didn't come to church. It was the word Jesus. We didn't get one response that people didn't like Jesus. He comes right out and shows God's love. How much does he love us? He says, I'll spread out my arms upon the cross this wide for you to demonstrate my love for you. Talk is cheap. I will sacrifice my life on a blood-stained cross in agony and in pain. And that cross and that love and my outstretched arms will stand as a permanent reminder to all people at all times of how deep and high and wide and broad is my love for you. Okay, so God loves us. He says it and he shows it. Next question, what practical difference does that make in my life? And I want to deal with that question. So the question becomes, if this great God loves me, 
question becomes, of what practical difference does it make in my life today? Right now, what difference does this everlasting, unceasing, unfailing, steadfast love of God for me to be invited into his very family circle, what difference does it make in my life today? And the first way I suggest that when we live in this awareness of God's love is that we feel valued. If I matter to God, then I matter. If I am important to God, then I'm important. I have this new sense of security and identity and value about myself. Last year, I spent some time in a 10th grade classroom of our, our local high school. I was invited in just to help the kids do a self-check on themselves. And I asked them the, the question, how do you feel about yourselves? And I, I invited one girl to come up to the front to write words and phrases on this high-tech kind of blackboard that they had these days in the classrooms. And I, I was stunned at how many said, well, when you ask me about myself, I feel like I am, and here's the words they used, constantly measured and evaluated. That's the world I live in. It's a world of measurement about school or academics or sports or activities. I feel constantly compared with other people to see on the scale, on the leaderboard of where I'm doing. Measured, evaluated, compared. And, and then they got into, oh, and if that's not enough, then it's about my peers. Not only do my parents and my educators, my coaches evaluate me, but it's my peers, this whole social media thing. When I look at what people are doing in the pictures I see, I say, that, that, that's not me. I don't look like that. I, I can't dress like that. I can't go on those kinds of vacations. I don't always have those kinds of smiles on my face. I, I'm seeing the very best of people in our social media, and I just can't measure up. I can never do enough. It's this desire to be valued. I remember when I was a young little boy riding my tricycle around in our driveway and I went inside and opened the door, went inside, and I said, Mom, Mom, come come out, come out and sit in the chair out here. And she said, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm busy, but I'll, I'll come out. And she sat in the chair. I said, watch me ride my bike. And so I rode around as fast as I could a couple times. She said, you are such a good bike rider. And that sense of valuation felt so good to me. And that's what God wants to do in his love, is he wants, to, he wants to implant that valuation into us, that we matter, that we are important to him. Life is self-image, self-value depleting. Every day when we go out there, there, it's like we opened the day with a bank account of 10 coins, and throughout the day those coins are diminished and diminished until finally we come home at night and we have two or three coins left. It's depleting. Life makes withdrawals. God says, I want to make a deposit. A new sense of worth and value that you matter, that you're important. And you'll see as we, in these three uh, practical differences of how that makes a difference. Because the second way is not only do we feel valued before God because we matter, we're important. We are important. But secondly, we can feel a sense of understanding. He understands us. God created us to be known, and in being known, to be loved and understood. He wants us to be understood. And, and one of the ways he does that is he provides people in, in our lives. My, my wife, Susan, uh, sometimes when I'm be struggling through some issue, and we'll have a little chat, and I think, you know, this woman knows me better than I know myself. And there's something good about that understanding, about that knowingness about me. I had a friend I chatted with this week several times on the phone. I have known this man 
and his wife for 50 years. And when he calls, immediately we pick up with, he knows me. He understands me. His love is unfailing for me. And it, and, and it just feels good. I can breathe and relax and be accepted. He understands me. But not only are, do we have a desire to be understood by significant people in our lives, but we have a desire to be understood by God himself. I love the doctrine of the providence of God. The doctrine of the providence of God says that beneath the visible world, beneath the surface of the world that we see, the visible world, is the invisible hand of God. God may be silent in the visible world, but he never stops acting beneath the surface. He's always at work, working his ways. It's the doctrine of the providence of God. He may be silent, but he's never still. And he tells us, now, I don't want you to pay too much attention to the visible world. I want you to walk by faith. Because, he says, sometimes your sight doesn't always tell you the whole story. You see, we see the world, our lives, our situations, whatever moment you're in, this very moment, wherever you find yourself, we view that from a finite, limited perspective. But God, in the doctrine of the providence of God, views our lives in an infinite, eternal, everlasting vantage point. He gets it all. He understands the total picture. So that when he says, I understand you, I love you and I understand you, he understands the whole thing. He understands the things that we can see and the things that we can't see. He understands everything about us. This is what we call reality. He sees all of reality. Everything. My understanding is limited. It's finite. God's is infinite. It's eternal. And when God says, I want you to feel understood, he means, I understand everything about you. I made you. I hand fashioned you. I created you. I molded you. I understand your inner being. I understand what's going to happen next in your life. I understand the purpose for what you're going through right now. I understand you. Well, not only can we feel valued by God, and not only do we feel, feel understood by God, but we can feel assured by God. Let me tell you what I think this means. He, he, he writes uh, in Lamentations. It's not a book we read very often, but there is a phenomenal verse in there that I memorized a long time ago. I had my kids memorize. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, in which it says this, the steadfast love, that is the kaseh, the eternal, unfailing, unceasing love of God, of the Lord, does what? It never ceases. It is unceasing. Now, because of that, Lamentations 3, 23, his mercies never come to an end. They are ongoing. And then here's what I really love. They are new every morning. New every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. I love that, that concept, that metaphor, that imagery, that his love is new every morning. I love it. Because my kids were involved in sports early on in, in grade school and high school, uh, they were hockey players. And hockey players have to have sheets of ice to play on, and they're hard to get. And, and oftentimes, the younger you are, the earlier you have to get these sheets of ice. So I can remember, remember many Sunday mornings of rolling out of bed at 4.30 in the morning to get to the hockey rink by 5.30, get these kids all dressed up, play a game at 6 o'clock, get home by 7 or 7.30, and go to church and do two ser church services. Just as people were waking up, my day was almost finished. A lot of weekend wake-up calls. And on the drivings to the rink, it was generally around sunrise. 
there's there's something about daybreak. Daybreak. God says, my mercies are new every morning, every daybreak. You can be assured of that. You can be confident of that. God says, and, and this came to me in, in, in those early morning drives to the hockey rink when the sun would rise. God says, look at the sun. It rises every single day. You can count on it. In this passage, he is saying to us, it is a permanent reminder, the sunrise every day is a permanent reminder of my love for you, that it's not going to go away. It's not going to run out. It is renewable every day, all day. Let the sunrise remind you of that. So that, Stu, you don't have to go looking for love today. You don't have to seek valuation or approval. You already have it. You start every day assured of my love for you. And I'm not some little tiny God. I am this ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful, exceedingly righteous God, and my sunrise reminds you and assures you of my love for you every day. Now, what happens when we live in an assurance of God's love for us is that we do feel valued, known, accepted. And when we live in the assurance of God's love for us, we do feel understood and known and accepted. No more comparisons. And when we live that way, we can face each day, every new morning, knowing of God's unceasing love for us. And when we do that, the whole outlook of our lives change. We're born again. We're different. We're different. Our inner core is, is dramatically changed. Now, the only question becomes, how do we respond to this unceasing love of God? That God says, I pour out my love to you every single day. Now, be careful. If you get so fast, moving so fast, you'll miss it. But I do. Slow down and see my love, my unceasing love for you every single day, every day, all day. And I have loved you like that since before the day you were born. Every day I have loved you and watched over you and cared for you and accepted you. And, and, and when we, we discover God's love for us, it opens up a whole new vantage point of life. When we receive it and embrace it, the whole temperature of our life changes. And, and, and the more we experience it and know it, the more we want to live in it and have it and get a grip on it in our lives. Every sunrise, every day. So that, so that, one day when we enter into the great throne room of the all-powerful great God, our all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, exceedingly righteous God. We will not have to wonder, how does this God feel about me? How does he view me? What is my standing before him? The fifth great wonder of the spiritual world is our God is an exceedingly, unceasingly, unfailingly loving God for you and for me personally. My love for you is everlasting. It's unceasing. And I will show you that love every morning. And when I do, you will feel valued. And you will feel understood. And you will live in a certainty of my love for you. Well, let's stop now and, and close our time in a word of prayer about this great love of our God for you and me.
To do that, I want to read a passage from Ephesians 3, verse 17, to begin our prayer, where Paul writes these words. I pray that you, firmly fixed in love yourselves, this is the J.B. Phillips version, may be able to grasp how wide and deep and long and high is the love of Christ, and to know for yourselves that love so far beyond our comprehension. And so, may you be filled through all your being with God himself. This is our prayer this day, that you and I will take the time to know and receive and embrace and comprehend the love of God for you and me. Amen.